everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today's guest is one of my favorite doctors in the space of sugar addiction. She has one of the most popular TED Talks in the world about it. I'll link to it below. You have to watch it. But today is the launch day of her new book called Sugarless. You need to buy it, need to buy it today, or at least this week, because it really does help authors if you're going to get their book to get it early, because it, it, it does make a difference. As an author, I can tell you that. And we're going to discuss the science of sugar addiction and how to beat it. Please welcome Dr. Nicole Avina. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited about your new book. Oh, thank you so much, Chef AJ. I'm so happy to be here. I always love talking with you. Yeah, And I'm so happy that you did an audible because, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I haven't read all your books because I don't read books that I can't listen to anymore, but just because of time and preference. So I'm so happy that it's available in audible as well. Yes, the book is available at Audible, and it's also available today online and everywhere books are sold. So I'm very excited about it. Launch day is a big day. Me too. Well, we're going to dive deep into the book. But first, I want to thank you, because I have a book coming out next August, and it's a dessert cookbook. And you were so kind not only to endorse it. I don't decide which endorsements make the covers, but apparently yours was so good. It's on the back cover. It's first. And you write, as a research scientist, I've been warning people about the dangers of added sugar for years. And now thanks to Chef AJ, you can enjoy your favorite treats without worry, sweet and naturally. This is a game changer, changing guide for anyone who wants to improve their health. Dr. Nicole Avina, PhD, and with all your wonderful accolades. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. Oh, absolutely. And I'll tell you, after leafing through that book, I'm telling you, that's going to be a big, big hit because I think desserts are one of the things that so many people struggle with, especially if they have a sweet tooth and they're trying to cut back on sugar. And you just had so many amazing recipes and ideas in there that I think people are just going to absolutely devour that. So it's going to be a huge hit. I know it. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for saying that because, you know, it's interesting because sugar, as you know, is insidious, right? It's in baby formula, it's in cigarettes, it's in pretty much every processed food. You can avoid it. If you're willing to not eat processed food, it's possible to avoid it, right? I mean, and even now, you, certain things are, you can find ketchup without sugar. It's very common now. You know, you go into Whole Foods or even the regular grocery store, it may still have salt and other things, but it's it's getting better. But to make dessert without some kind of sweet, and I don't like the fake ones, I'll, I'll tell you, from a culinary standpoint and from a, a you know, medical standpoint, I don't think they're very healthy. But but thanks for saying that, because I want to talk about like, what is sugar? And is sugar, this is, we talked about this a little before, is sugar addiction real? Because we have doctors that went to medical school that come on Chef AJ Live and say, you don't die from the detox, so it's not an addiction. Yeah, I mean, there's so many different things we could say about what you just said. So I guess let's start with the whole idea of is sugar addictive? I think that's like a great place to start. And so I mean, this to me is something that's a near and dear question to my heart because I've been studying whether or not sugar could be addictive for over 20 years. It was actually the first thing I started studying when I came to Princeton to do my PhD in neuroscience. And I never in a million years thought I'd still be studying it, but here we are because there's so many different things around it that we still have yet to learn about. But I can tell you, we've done research studies, not only in my laboratory, but in labs throughout the world that have shown that sugar can produce the same criteria as drugs of abuse, like alcohol, nicotine, morphine, cocaine, you name it. And it's not just the binging or the behavioral stuff, right? Because you could see binging with lots of different things. We've actually seen that there are changes in the brain that occur in response to eating sugar that are identical to what happens when someone's using drugs or alcohol. And so, you know, to speak to the point of saying that, you know, sugar's not addictive because the detox will kill you. Well, I guess it depends on your addiction, your definition of addiction. The American Psychiatric Association and most major medical communities would say that sugar is addictive because it does meet all the criteria that are laid forth for a substance of abuse. So if it's addictive, why are they allowed to put it in food if we know it's addictive? Because, for example, I'm not saying that it shouldn't be sold that, you know, I'm not not trying to change that because we when I grew up, people smoked, people still smoke, less people, but people would smoke in the supermarket, on the airplane, in the grocery store. And at one point that changed and then they couldn't, they can't, people can't smoke in restaurants. Really, I think maybe in Vegas, I don't know, but there's now a warning on the packet of cigarettes, right? So why can't there be, a, let them sell it if they want, but why can't there be that label on every food with sugar? That's what I would do if I was- well, 
Yeah, I think that's the direction we're headed in, to be quite honest. And, you know, if you take a look at what happened in terms of the tobacco story, right, and the regulation around that, like you said, you know, back in, you know, the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, people were smoking all over the place. It wasn't until the 1960s, 70s that we started to see regulations put in place. So it started off with warning labels. Then it started off with restrictions of advertising so that we couldn't advertise it to minors. Then it started off with, you know, you had to be of a certain age to purchase it. And so slowly but surely, we started to see more and more regulations come in when people started to realize, wow, these dangers are real. This stuff is really hurting us and harming our health. And I think that's what's happening with sugar. It's just taking a lot longer and it's a slower process. But we have seen on the nutrition facts label now, we do need to have our amount of added sugars disclosed on the nutrition facts label. Companies now have to disclose that. They didn't have to up until very recently. And so that's one step. And I think, you know, in the UK, they're actually talking about in Parliament passing some legislation that will require warning labels on ultra processed foods, foods that have lots of added sugar. So if that happens in the UK, I would say that we are going to start to see some of those changes happen more quickly here in the US. It's just really, I think, a matter of time and getting people to take this seriously. And that's one of the things that's so frustrating for me as a, you know, researcher, but also just as a regular person, as a parent, that, you know, a lot of people don't heed these warnings. They don't think it's real. They don't think that eating too much sugar is going to give you cardiovascular disease or diabetes, or it's going to have, you know, issues that are going to promote you to have like low mood and it's going to impact your mental health, but it does. And there's tons of research studies that show that. Well, you know, that's all I've been talking about. Pretty, I feel like that's all I've talked about. You know, I mean, sometimes I use the word food addiction, but I, that's a terrible term, actually, because I think it's it's I think it's really refined carbohydrate addiction. You know, sugar, flour, alcohol. That's what I mean. I don't see anybody. I've never gone to an Arugal Anonymous meeting ever. I've never seen a per, because you actually said something. You know, I, I love what yeah, I re-listened to some of your uh, talks. And I remember you said something really interesting that I type this. Here we go. That. Dopamine levels off when food becomes boring. Most people find vegetables to be the most boring food in the world. I don't see really a lot of people binging on broccoli, you know, or any whole natural food, really. Yeah, it's true. And that's one of the things about the brain that is really telling about this whole story about whether or not sugar can be addictive. Because when we do these research studies looking at sugar and we look at dopamine, which is one of those neurotransmitters that's involved with pleasure and reward, every time dopamine goes up, that gives you this feeling of euphoria. Every time you use a drug of abuse, you get that feeling of euphoria because of that dopamine. Every time you use sugar, you get that feeling of euphoria. But like you said, every time you have some asparagus or broccoli or, you know, even grilled chicken, you're not going to have that happen. Right. And so it's really something special about the sugar that seems to be promoting these changes in the brain that result in these addiction like feelings and then also the behaviors that come along with that. You know, I, I, I read, yeah, I'm sure you've read sugar blues. That was, I think one of the first books about it. And if I'm understanding this correctly, sugar was a condiment back in the day. Like it was like, you know, kind of how we use curry or turmeric that, you know, it was a sprinkle. It wasn't, you know, 16 mm -hmm. teaspoons in a 12 ounce can of Coke. And so do you, do you believe like, I, I can't remember his name. Is it not Pericles? Like the, the, he was a famous doctor, toxicologist, and he was known for saying the dose makes the poison. Absolutely. I a hundred percent believe that's the problem that we're seeing right now. And if you look back, you know, even into times just 200 years ago, sugar was a rarity. People would give, you know, sh sugar as a gift to somebody because it was hard to come by. It wasn't something that we were seeing, you know, injected into every single thing that we eat. And the dose is so important. That's why when people talk about things like fruit and will say to me, well, what about fruit? Fruit contains sugar. Is that addictive? My answer is always no, not at all. If anything, that's the thing you should be using if you feel a sweet craving because fruit Yes, it contains fructose and it contains, you know, other sugars, but it's packaged in a dose that our bodies are able to handle. And it's also packaged with fiber and other nutrients. Whereas if you look at a candy bar or a granola bar, it's going to have an amount of sugar in it that our bodies are not designed to handle. 
And I think that's where it comes back to thinking about how, you know, we evolved to be able to live in our food environment and our food environment to keep up with it. And that's part of the problem we're seeing these days is that there's so much added sugar in our diet that our brains can't handle it, our bodies can't handle it. And it's really almost like a foreign product that we're consuming. And now our bodies are coping with it by giving us heart disease, cancer, diabetes, all these other conditions as an end product. And that's really part of the problem now. Right. And and also, it's not like most people, even the hardcore sugar addicts I know, don't eat sugar as a food. So in other words, they're not just taking sugar cubes or packets of sugar. It's always packaged with something that seems to attenuate is addictive. You know, it's sugar and caffeine, right? You know, Red Bull. You know, people with coffee putting more, putting sugar in it or putting cream, which some people could say dairy has an addictive compound or sugar with fat, you know, because in nature, it it wasn't a problem. You know, people didn't become addicted, like you say, didn't become addicted to fruit. People even that ate dates, you know, that it wasn't the fruit, which has the fiber, the micronutrients, the fiber. It's when you strip it away and eat it as a drug. I, I think, I mean, I think it's a drug and, you know, I haven't had it knowingly. I'm sure there was a couple of times where I think somebody put something in, but I mean, it's been, it's been, it's, I'm going on my 21st year of being sugar sober. And so I know it's possible. I think a lot of people think it's impossible and I'm not saying it wasn't difficult, but I think living in the world of having those constant cravings and being addictive to a a substance. I think that was a more difficult life than, I mean, you know, when you're abstinent for as long as I've been, I don't even think about it. Like I don't eat, like when I look at the white powder, I I think of it as like rat poison. I don't, I don't even think of it as like you, you would eat that, you know, that's how I feel about it, especially because I can have all this with make it with fruit. But I, I think Dr. Ravina, it's so insidious in our culture, you know, I mean, think about everywhere you go, Petco, sugar. I mean, why is there, why is there candy at Petco? Why is there pan, uh, candy at Home Depot, at every hardware store, at every fabric store, at every hospital? Like it, like it, a hospital I volunteer at, it's not just in the cafeteria. It's, there's a vending machine in the parking lot. I guess you can't get to the door without it. So I, I don't know how we're going to ever change culture because there's not very many of us that are talking about this, about how bad this really is. This I think it's an epidemic. Oh, it's absolutely an epidemic. It's a public health crisis. And I think that what we need to do is really educate people about this, because I think you're right. Not a lot of people are aware of this. And because we see sugar just kind of creeping into all aspects of our life, we almost don't even notice it. It's become so normalized to just have candy bars for sale everywhere and all these sweet treats available all the time. And so I think that for most people, it's it's sort of just happening and they are not even necessarily aware that it's happening or aware of why it's so dangerous. And so that's one of the things that led me to want to write the book, Sugarless, is the fact that, you know, it's so pervasive in our society. Sugar is literally everywhere. And we have to learn how to cope with it. We have to learn how to navigate in this sugar centric society. And it's not easy when, like we were saying, it's everywhere. I mean, if you think about people who are addicted to drugs or alcohol, if you're addicted to alcohol, you could avoid the bars, you could, you know, let people know in your family and your friend circle, look, I don't really want to have alcohol around me, it's going to be a trigger, and they'll understand. But sugar, it's a different story, you can't really avoid it, it sneaks into different foods, you might imagine if you were someone struggling with alcohol addiction, and you didn't realize there was potentially alcohol in some of the foods that you were eating, and the food companies like, you know, slipped it in there as the fifth ingredient on the, you know, ingredients list. I mean, that would be terrible, but that's what happens with sugar. And so many people are struggling with trying to cut back. And not only are they facing these societal issues, like you said, of vending machines everywhere and candy bars at the checkout, but then they also have this fact that it's hidden in any of our foods and the food companies have injected it into our food supply in so many different ways. Yeah. You know, you talk about cutting back and we can have a whole conversation on abstinence versus moderation. 
and we will, but I first want to point out what one of the things I love in your book on page 106 is you have an actual quiz that people can take, um, you know, because a lot of people, well, nobody wants to be called an addict. That's why I think we had a different word, but, uh, you know, you can, how about a, a, an overuser or an abuser of sugar? Because I hear probably from more people, whether, whether they have weight issues associated with it or not, that they just can't quit. And so I ask these experts that say there's no such thing as an addiction. If the people can't quit, then, then what is it? What is is it, you know? Right, exactly. And that's one of the reasons why I included the quiz, because I think a lot of times because it's become so normalized to have sugar everywhere and have it in so many of our foods, people don't even realize that their relationship with it is unhealthy, that they can't say no. And I think for those individuals who are really struggling to cut back, who are looking for help when they turn to their doctor or when they turn to, you know, somebody to get help, a lot of times, you know, people don't know what to suggest. There's really, you know, a limited amount of information out there for people who are struggling with this. But it is a real thing. And I think it's important for people to realize, even if you're not overweight or don't have health problems linked to your diet, that doesn't mean you're not going to develop those things at some point. That's why even for people who are healthy, for young people, you really do need to be mindful about the added sugar in your diet, because eventually it's going to catch up with you no matter what. And, and, you know, like I remember, you know, the last time, you know, I remember the last time I had sugar knowingly it was Coke Slurpee and Dr. Pepper at the same time, because I was actually going into what I call rehab. They, there's no such thing for sugar rehab, but there's a couple of places I've been like the Optimum Health Institute and in True North where you can actually detox there. And, you know, I, I, just so you know, I don't eat these rich desserts. I really don't. I eat, I mean, most of the time I eat fruit. And it's like very sweet. I mean, I find fruit like so sweet now, sometimes, especially grapes and bananas. I'm like, whoa, you know, I could never eat fruit back then. It was just disgusting to me. But I use the richer recipes in my book. It's kind of as a transition to get off white sugar, <laughs> making things with dates and things like that. And that, that, that really helped me. But I find, and you can tell me with the people that you know or work with, that cutting back is harder than not having it at all because it then I just you still want it, you know, you, you know, you think you got to like kind of white knuckle it and use willpower, but when you don't have it, you don't have it. And for me, that's easier, but is that, is that a, even a possibility for people and how would you work with them or teach them? Cause really what I want to know about in your book is you say it's a plan for what's the plan. If you can give us just yeah. a little secret. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So there's really sort of two avenues with this and a lot of times some people can just say, you know what, I'm going to be able to cut out the sugar. I'm not going to have it in my diet. And they're going to take the approach that it sounds like you took where they're just going to walk away. They're going to make all the changes that they need to make and they're going to be done with it. And I think for people who have a very severe addiction to sugar, that is the route that works best. Now, I think that there's another group of the people in our population who maybe have what would be a mild or moderate addiction to sugar. And for those individuals, they fall into a different category because they may have struggled with trying to cut back, but they don't really know where to start and they don't want to completely give it up, but they know they need to cut back dramatically. And so I have a plan in place in the book for those individuals as well, where you can start to make incremental changes in your behavior, because this isn't a diet book. It's not like a temporary thing that you're going to do to like lose some weight. This is a way in which we eat. This is a different way of having a relationship with food. And it's about recognizing the role that you want sugar to play in your diet. And so I walk through seven steps that people can take to identify the sugars in their diet figure out if they can make some swaps. Fruit is one of the big, big swaps that I have incorporated into the diet book or the, the plan throughout because like you said, fruit is really nature's candy. It is the thing that can satisfy your sweet tooth. But if you've been on a diet where you've been having lots of added sugar for many, many years, you know, thinking about eating a strawberry might not really do it for you, right? But trust me, once you get yourself off of eating all that processed sugary food, a strawberry is going to taste delicious and sweet to me because I don't eat added sugar. Dates are so sweet that I, I literally can morsel a morsel. I know. Before I Amen, sister. I, I rarely eat dates. Once in a while, people give me with a specific day called the Bari Day, B-A-H-R-I, which tastes like Kraft Caramel. And so sometimes I will eat those, but it's not, but like you say, it's just 
it's mind-blowingly sweet. You know, that's why I, you don't have to eat sugar, you know, but it, I don't know, people really struggle that I can tell you, especially this time of year, you know, where it's everywhere. Uh Starting you know, I think Halloween, Halloween, we need to make a law that we don't have. I mean, we can still have the costumes and the, you know, let's trick or, tr but that, that, I think that's where it starts, especially for people that have food addictions. I mean, they, they're just going to imbibe in a little bit of a fun size Snickers. And then we don't hear from them again until January 3rd. They, you know, because it, they go into like a sugar coma for those three months. Oh yeah. Halloween has become the unofficial start of sugar season. And it's really become something that I think over the years has gotten worse and worse because it starts off with the Halloween candy and then people say, oh, well, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up. I'll just, you know, enjoy myself during the holidays. Well, there's plenty of things you can do to enjoy yourself that don't involve eating lots of added sugar. So the psychology piece of it is huge. And I think that's something that I really try to focus on the book because I'm a psychologist. And one of the things that, you know, we learn is that it's about our relationship and our habits that we've formed. And a lot of times, many of the behaviors that people are engaging in around food are very habitual. A lot of people will realize that they're using sugar to self-soothe, to self-medicate. And so if you have, you know, a lot going on, it's busy during the holidays, you're a little anxious or, you know, got too many things on your plate, people might turn to sugar to make themselves feel better, to just calm themselves. And yeah, that works temporarily, but it's really not the best strategy, right? And then the same thing can happen when it comes to rewarding ourselves. We see this happen with kids all the time where, you know, it started off with a pediatrician handing out lollipops, which believe it or not, there are still pediatricians who hand out lollipops. Dentists. I knew a dentist in LA. I went to a dentist and like it was, they shared a thing and they weren't related in their practice. They didn't cover for each other. And then on their thing, they had candy, candy. You know, it's funny that you say that because my older daughter just got done with having her braces and she kind of like graduated from, you know, all of that. And so her parting gift from the orthodontist was this box. And I thought, oh, that's so nice. They're giving her, you know, some token of having come here for the past seven years. It was a big box of candy. I was ready to throw it right back at them. I could not believe it. But yes, there are so many people who are, you know, just really unaware of the fact that when we want to celebrate an accomplishment, you don't have to do it with sweets. We can do it with gift cards. We can do it with a hug. We can do it with, you know, petting our puppy or going for a walk. There's lots of different things that we can do. It doesn't have to be about food. But I, I think that schools are part of the problem. I mean, at least I, I don't can't vouch for every school and, or what they do at private schools, but I mean, what they serve children in public school, you know, it's just basically a lot of refined, not very healthy food, even if it may, I mean, like, I don't know what's in chicken nuggets or things or white bread, but it's, it's, I wouldn't call it health promoting. No, it's not. And most of those things do contain added sugar, believe it or not. And it's in part, not necessarily because it's trying to sweeten them because, you know, chicken nuggets aren't sweet, but they do have preservatives in them and the preservatives taste terrible. So you have to mask the taste of the preservatives. And what's the easiest way to do that? Pour some sugar on it. And so that's why you see sugar added to lots of different processed foods or shelf stable products that you might see in your pantry and wonder why would you put sugar in this? One of the things when I was doing research for the book that I came across that was, sh was so shocking was English muffins. English muffins have sugar in them. And you might think, well, they don't taste sweet, but they have preservatives in them. That's why they can last on the shelves in the grocery store for weeks. And so again, it's not just the sweet stuff that we have to be worried about. We also have to just be mindful of all of the different products that are out there that have that nutrition facts label. I tell people, you know, we all are busy. If you want to go to the grocery store and physically walk through the grocery store, you need to take your time and you need to have the time to look at the nutrition facts label to see the ingredients so that you can see whether or not the foods contain added sugar. You can't just tell by eyeing it anymore by looking at this and saying, oh, there can't be sugar in that. There's likely sugar in many of the things that you don't even know about. Right. Well, you know, the best thing is to eat food that doesn't have a label. That is the best. And one of the things that I talk about in the book is, you know, really revising our relationship with food. And I get it. I'm busy. 
I work, my husband works, we've got two kids, there are a zillion activities. Everybody's busy, everybody has a lot going on. But we have something that I'm sure you can speak to because it is such a fundamental ability and skill that we need. And many kids these days aren't able to experience that with their parents because their parents are so busy. And so I talk a lot in the book about how we've got to get back to the basics on some level with this, teaching our kids about cooking skills, teaching them about healthy eating, teaching them about how you can prepare foods. Otherwise, we're going to have a generation of kids who thinks that you go to the grocery store and buy some pre-made dinner for dinner every night, and they're not going to know how to do it themselves. And so I think it's really important that we make the time to do that. It's just like we make the time to go to the gym, just like we make the time you know, to watch our favorite show on Netflix. We've got to get back to making the time to cook. I love cooking. I've always loved cooking. Yeah. My grandma lived with us when I was a kid and, you know, she was this little old Italian lady and taught me to make all these things. And it was just like a really joyful part of my childhood. And so I have tried to do that with my kids and kind of keep that tradition going. And I think all of us really need to think about how we can, you know, get young kids, especially excited about cooking again. I agree with you. And, it, you know, it doesn't have to be as complicated as people make it. There's tools like the Instant Pot. I don't I don't cook real fancy meals all the time except for special occasions. But the problem is, it, in many people's minds, it's never going to be as fast, cheap, and easy as it is going through the drive through Right. And again, I think it's about, you know, playing the long game. And I, I use that term a lot in a lot of different things that I discuss. But we tend to get hyper-focused on what's going to be the easiest. And yeah, it might be easier right now to go to the grocery or to go to the pick up something pre-made or go through the drive through but it's not going to be easier in the long run when you have to manage your diabetes or your, you know, child suddenly has some health conditions and now they can't play their favorite sports. I mean, these are things that really happen that are diet related that we can control. So if you want to protect your health and you want to instill these skills and instill, you know, this concept of healthy eating into our young kids, we have to start off by going back to some of these things. And like you said, it doesn't have to be complicated. I have 30 recipes in sugarless that don't contain any added sugar and they are simple. They're easy because that's what we want. We want to have things that are basic things that aren't going to take hours sleeping away at the kitchen. So like you said, it doesn't have to be complicated and there's lots of tools out there that can make it easy. Yeah, I, I agree with you a hundred percent. Do you think that people need support in getting off sugar? Like they might with drugs of abuse or alcohol? I absolutely do. I think that it's not something that is easy to do alone because, again, we live in this very sugar centric society. We have a lot of sugar pushers out there. Right. We have these people who call you know, grandparents. They're called grandparents. They are, <laughs> they are grandparents and yeah. they are oh, teachers. Unfortunately, there are other peers of ourselves that you know, maybe just don't get it, don't understand why we want to cut back on sugar. And I had this experience recently when my husband and I went out to dinner with another couple and, you know, the other couple wanted to get dessert. And I said, well, I'm, I'm good. I'm kind of still full from the meal. And I was then quizzed as to, well, why don't you just have one little piece of cake? Why don't you want to have any? Almost as if it was like an offense to them that I didn't want to have sugar. And I just, you know, said, you know what, guys, I'm good. If you want to get a piece, enjoy it. I'm happy to sit here and, you know, continue our conversation. I'm not in a rush. Get get it. But don't, like, force me to get it or try to make me feel bad about it. Yeah, food bullies. And and I wonder if, you know, if it's because you say you're a psychologist. I wonder if it's a, partly a status issue because, you know, those it, the same thing can happen. I have I know I don't drink alcohol with people that don't drink alcohol. Like, well, you think you're better than me, you know, because you're doing this, obviously. But but that is the hardest thing, I think, to navigate some of these social situations, you know? It's true. So sugar and alcohol, I feel like, are the two things that you have to justify why you're not having them, right? That Those are the two things that people seem to come after you and say, well, why aren't you drinking? Why not have alcohol? And I think you're right. I think a little bit of it is a bit of a saddest thing. But I also think it's that 
you know, people deep down know that they're engaging in an unhealthy behavior and they're looking for you to join in. So it's kind of like, you know, if we're all doing it, it doesn't seem like it's a bad thing. It's this groupthink mentality. So I think that, you know, that's one of the things I, I do spend a decent amount of time in the book talking about is how do we navigate those social situations? Like, how do you, you know, have a dinner with somebody and not have it be awkward? How do you prepare yourself so that you can stand up and just say, you know what, I'm good. I don't need to have it, but you guys are more than welcome to. It's not as easy as it sounds. I think a lot of people often, you know, go in with good intentions and a plan of, you know, I, I these are the things I want to eat. I'm choosing not to eat this. But then when they start to get pressured, they came to the pressure. So I talk a lot about how you can avoid that and avoid these social traps and things that you can actually do to prevent them from happening in the first place. Yeah, it's... Well, thank you for your work, guys. This is a great book. I've been putting the link frequently in the live chat, but it's also in the show notes. And it really, if you're going to get it, get it today or at least in the next few days, because it does help authors and so that more of these books will come out. And it's a great book. And uh, speaking of a great book, all your books are great. And what I love about some of your other books, I've learned so much from you because you, you know, you you mentioned about how this preference for sugar, that's, I mean, that's in the womb. It's like if our mother ate a lot of sugar guess what we're going to prefer? It's true. Yeah, there is a big evolutionary component to it and a big generational component to it that's inherited from our mothers. And there's a whole line of research that's been looking at that. But don't go calling up your mom and yelling at her just yet because it's not something that's permanent. It just means that you're at risk. And so just being aware of the fact that, you know, you could be born into this world with a sweet tooth based off of what mom was eating so you just need to be mindful of that and be aware of the fact that, you know what, I really need to think harder about some of these decisions I'm making around what I'm going to eat because I'm at greater risk of developing an addiction to sugar. I'm at greater risk of, you know, overdoing it when it comes to having the added sugar. Yeah. Why do we love sugar? Is it because it's our, like with breast milk was sweet? Is it just an innate preference in humans? My dog doesn't like anything sweet. Not that I would give her anything sweet, but sometimes I'll be eating fruit and she has no interest, but uh, you know, potatoes, yes. Yeah. So it, it's an evolutionary thing. So we were designed by nature to crave things that are sweet because in nature, think about it, the things that are sweet in nature are good for us and they're going to be nourishing. Fruit is good. If you, our ancestors were hunters and gatherers. If they stumbled upon an apple tree, they're going to eat all the apples because you don't know when you're getting apples again. And it's something that's delicious and you're going to want to make sure that you consume it. But you wouldn't eat the sour apples that had fallen to the floor that were rotten because those aren't sweet. Those are poisonous. Those aren't good for you. And so we have this evolutionary desire for sweet things because they're coded as being safe and good for us. Same with breast milk, right? And so think about that though. Now in our modern food environment, that sort of evolutionary drive is still there, but the rules have changed. Sugar is not always sweet because it's not just in fruit. It's in you know, bacon. It doesn't need to be in tomato sauce. I make my own marinara and it's delicious. If I need sweetener, I can use a red bell pepper, a carrot, a date, yep. a little bit of balsamic vinegar. But you're right. It, 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 it's a preservative. That's well. And it's also addictive. Do you think the processed food industry, I mean, because I've read Sugar, Fat and Salt by Michael Moss and Hooked by Michael Moss. And of course, The End of Overeating by Dr. David Kessler. Do you think they knew it? Like, I, did you think they knew it when they started that they were going to do this or was they just got lucky? Well, you know, Michael Moss, he's a dear, dear person. He gave one of the endorsements for my book. And I think that whether or not the food industry knew it or not, now they know it and they're utilizing it to their advantage. And I think that one of the things that we're finding out from the research is that, you know, this is about consumer demand. And the problem is now, because the food industry has put so much sugar into the different food products that we have, if they were to suddenly just tomorrow decide to take all the sugar out, people will go bananas because they're so used to having all this sugar. And so the desire for all this sugar has gotten elevated and elevated and elevated over the years. So now we're at the point where, you know, the bliss point for the sweetness has become so high that it's just off the charts compared to anything that we've seen before in the history of humankind. And so 
it's really going to be a challenge, I think, to get this to change in terms of how we're going to turn this around. But I do think that it's going to be a grassroots effort. We have to really just start to educate more and more people about it and about the dangers of too much sugar. And I think it's going to take some efforts on the parts of, you know, people like you, Chef AJ, and others that have a voice for health and that are advocating for our health. And one of the best things you can do if you care about your health is to cut back on added sugar. Any doctor that says otherwise, I would love to talk to them and have a conversation because it is literally the one thing that you can do that I can guarantee is going to help improve your health. Let's talk to your daughter's orthodontist first. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so and Anne wants to know, does it help it? Like she wants to buy your book, but she says, does it matter where she buys it? If she buys it on Audible, can it be just as helpful to you? Or does the people have to buy, you know, the hard copy? Oh, thank you. And any place that you're able to get your hands on it, please buy it by all means. That's so wonderful. And Audible, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, it's in the, all the bookstores right now. So wherever it, you can the copy, it, grab it. The truth is, is I'm going to buy it on, I have this, but I'm going to buy it on Audible as soon as we get off the air, because then, you know, that'll be good for you. And I love the title of your first chapter, how sugar causes you to overeat and harms your health. I don't think the fact that it harms your health, people are necessarily um, going to argue with, I, they don't want to know it, but, but how, I, I know the answer to this, by the way, but how do I want you to answer? Because you're the doctor. How does sugar cause us to overeat? Well, I think that's the piece that people are often surprised by because they don't realize until I think they start to look through the research and hear about this, that when we eat sugar, it activates our brain in a way that causes us to then crave more sugar. It's releasing these neurochemicals in the brain that kicks off this cycle of addiction, right? And even if you're not a, a full-blown addict to sugar where you're like, you know, give me the sugar wherever I go, it's starting this cascade of events where, you know, you have sugar and then, you know what, I, I kind of like it. I, I think I could have a little bit more. One of the things about the foods that mostly contain added sugar, is they're not satiating. They don't often have a lot of protein in them. They don't have healthy fats. And so basically they're, foods that contain sugar and other carbohydrates that aren't going to make you feel full. And so there's nothing that's really reining you in, in the sense of, you know, causing satiety to make you want to stop. And when you layer on top of that, the fact that the sugar is making your brain crave it more and more and more and more, it's really just a recipe for overeating. And aside from that, we have that whole issue, like we've been talking about, of the fact that, you know, sugar is so pervasive, it's in so many of the different things that we eat. It's really difficult. And I give lots of examples in the book about this. Of all the different healthy food products that are marketed to us that often contain added sugar, even if you think you're, you know, yogurt is a great example. Yogurt's got protein in it. It's got probiotics. It's good for us. But many of the yogurt brands out there are loaded with added sugar. I mean, more than candy bars. So you really need to be mindful of the fact that even when you think you're eating healthy, odds are you might be eating more sugar than you realize. And that's causing you to want to eat more sugar and more sugar and more sugar. And this vicious spiral just ensues. Well, you know, I, I, I heard that an average serving of like a jarred tomato sauce is got more sugar than two Oreos. And that that's just ridiculous. I love how <laughs> this is funny because well, I'm vegan for a long time. It was but I'm vegan. How can I beat my sugar addiction with all the carbs? Well, carbs aren't bad. I think it's the refined carbs that are bad. Yeah, absolutely. And that is a big point that I try to make in the book, because I think that all too often sugar and carbs get put together in the same discussion. I mean, you don't know how many times I've had people say, well, oh, I'm trying to cut back on sugar, so I'm not going to eat potatoes. And I'll say, but why? I mean, potatoes are like, if you're craving a, a carbohydrate, a potato could be a delicious addition to your diet. So I think that it's important to keep in mind that it's it's not this whole, you know, literally all the carbs that are out there, sugars and carbs kind of get tied together. And I go through, you know, the science of that, the sort of, you know, 
nutritional science of, you know, what is a sugar? What is added sugar? What are carbohydrates? What are these different categories of things that we can eat? Because I think, you know, the average person doesn't know this stuff. They don't unfortunately teach us this in high schools. I think they really should, to be quite honest. It should be part of, you know, the daily living class that people should be forced to take, but they're not. Um, but again, it's really about the added sugar. And again, if you're vegan, there are so many options in terms of cutting back on added sugar. You don't need added sugar if you're a vegan. Well, I mean, I, I, I just don't even know where I would eat sugar. Unless I ate processed food as a vegan, I mean, there's no processed sugar and fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. So I don't, you know, I think, but, but as a junk food vegan, absolutely. I love how Dr. David Katz says there's a big difference between lentils and lollipops. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a great, great, great saying. Yeah. I love it. Here's another chapter heading. I love, I did take, okay. And we need to, add, this is, this is, I think one of the main reasons that people don't go off sugar, which is why I believe sugar is addictive. Handling the hurdles, the triggers, withdrawals, and cravings. You know, when people say, well, I, you know, I, 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 sugar's not addicted. I'm not addicted. I go, okay, well go, you know, let's just go three weeks without it. And then, you know, like, they, they, they freak out. I go, you know, a lot of people, whatever the addiction is, coffee, sugar, they can't go one day. I mean, if you don't think it's addictive, then let's just, let's go a week without it guys and see. Yeah. And you're right. You know, I think a lot of people will think it's not addictive. And then if they're posed with a challenge like that, then, you know, they'll soon realize like, wow, you know, when I'm trying to go sugar free, certain things are still, my life is still going to go on. Certain things are still going to happen. And a lot of times that's when you realize what those triggers are that lead you to want to eat sugar. For a lot of people, it's stress. And it's, you know, oh, I have, you know, 50 emails that just came in and oh, I have to do all this stuff for my kid's school and, I, you know, all these things happening. And it's the day to day stress that a lot of times, you know, people will manage with sugar, manage with eating a lot of these processed foods. It's also sometimes this routine that can be a trigger. And so a lot of times people, you know, I call them sunsetters because I've seen this happen a lot of times over the years with people where they'll wake up and today's the day they're going to eat super healthy. They're going to exercise and they do it all. And then somewhere around three o'clock, something happens and they start to fall into these habits. It's sometimes because they haven't actually been eating enough food throughout the day and they're restricting too much. And what ends up happening is they fall into these habits where, you know, they come home from work and then they suddenly start to, you know, graze while they're making dinner. And it just sort of goes downhill from there. And they end up having ice cream and things that maybe, you know, weren't on their list of things that they plan to eat. And so, again, I think it's really about understanding what is it that's driving you to want to eat sugar. And I think that's part of the self-reflection that has to happen when you're going to make changes in your lifestyle. And that's a big part of it is understanding, you know, what role does sugar play in your life? And if you're using it to self soothe, if you're using it to self medicate, if you're using it to get through the day, that's not good. You want to have a healthy relationship with the fuel that you put in your body. You want to be putting things in your body that are going to love you back. And sugar is not one of those things. But I feel, I feel like our, the, the voices are growing, but I feel like we're still a minority, you know? I know. And I do agree with you on that. I think that more and more people, I think, are becoming aware of the dangers of sugar. But I think it takes people who have come on the other side of it and seen how they can feel when they don't eat added sugar, when they don't have, you know, all these processed foods in their diet and seeing how good you actually feel, how much better. I've had so many people over the years that I've worked with who've come to me and said, you know what, Dr. Vina? I never in a million years, if I knew I was going to feel this good after giving up sugar, I would have done it 10 years ago because it just seems so daunting to a lot of people because again, the addiction, that's what addiction does. Addiction plays with your mind and your heart and it tells you, you know what? You need me, you need me, you need me and you don't and it gets hold of you. And once you learn the tools and the tricks that I have outlined in my new book to break through that, you'll see that you can have a completely different life where you're not dependent on sugar. It's not owning you, you know, and I look at people who have gotten through this and are successful. And one of the things that I often hear people say is, you know what? It's not that I can't eat sugar. It's that I don't want to eat it. 
that I don't. I think don't is much more powerful than can't. Yeah, it's not, you know, and they will even say like, I have no desire to eat it because I, I don't want to feel that way ever again. I know how I used to feel and I know how I feel now. And I like this much, much better. And so I think helping people to understand that that is an actual reality and life can feel very different um, is something that I think is really going to push people forward. So here's a really interesting question that I've heard before from, is it, I think it's CJ. Let me find it in the chat because this talks about, I think speaks to why people even consume a sugar in such great quantities. What do you guys put in your tea or coffee? If you drink coffee, I try to drink them without sugar, but just can't. And that leads me to believe that that this, he doesn't, or she, I'm sorry, CJ doesn't like the taste of the tea or coffee. They're drinking it for the drug-like effect of the caffeine. Because if you need, you know, I always believe, and I don't remember if it was Robert Lustig, that Dr. Robert Lustig that said this, but if you need to sweeten what you're eating, you don't really like it. You don't need to sweeten watermelon or strawberries or mango or dates or bananas, right? It's because caffeine is it's so toxic that it's it's disgusting without the sugar. So that's something to look at right there. But but if, if I was asked and being asked that question as a chef, I would say date syrup, you know, or even soaking the water that you make it in in dates. That's what I would do because I don't think the processed fake sugars like the stevia, the xylitol, erythritol, I don't think they're any better. I think they're just as addictive. What do you say about that? Yeah. So I'm, I'm actually one of those people. I'm not, a, I don't drink a ton of coffee. I have a cup in the morning. I drink it black and I just like the taste of black coffee. I, I don't, I'm accustomed to it. And I just, you know, the thought of adding sugar to it to sweeten it isn't something that I feel like I need. Um, when it comes to those other types of sweeteners, I think that it's a little bit of a dicey situation because if the goal is to get off of added sugar, which it is, then they can play a role. Monk fruit, stevia. I mean, I don't necessarily see them as healthy, but I think in many cases they can be a crutch for people who are really, really struggling with added sugar. So if you're going from like the coffee creamer that has a, you know, eight grams of added sugar in it to maybe, you know, a couple of drops of stevia in your coffee as a way to transition, then I think that that's great. But I don't think that should be the end point. And I talk about this a lot in the book, because I think ultimately, these alternative sweeteners like monk fruit, stevia, you know, all the ones that are out there, they're band-aids. They're not going to help you break through that addiction, because they're still going to activate the reward center in the brain, they're still going to make you feel pleasure. So if you want to break up that relationship, you ultimately have to wean yourself off of those things as well. So I tell people, you know what, if you have to use them as a crutch, go ahead. But that crutch is temporary, and it's got to break soon. And ultimately, you want to try to just reduce your on sweeteners kind of like methadone like because you like I, people might think i sit here and eat pounds of dates every day i rarely eat them but for me the dates unlike the monk fruit which i don't think existed 20 years ago or if it did i didn't know about it, and i couldn't stand the taste of stevia i use that as a transition but i see people just as obsessed with these zero calories or uh, lower calorie sweeteners. I mean, I knew I know people that carry around these little bottles of stevia. And by the way, the stevia leaf that you can grow in nature is way different than the processed stevia that comes in flavors like chocolate caramel and butterscotch. And I've seen people walk around with these bottles with these droplets and they can't even drink a glass of water without it. So I've seen people become just as addictive to things, addicted to those, even though they may be less harmful and less calories. Also from hosting what's called the GI Health Summit, I've learned that those are not great for your gut. The erythritol, xylitol, mannitol, anything that ends in OL, even the stevia can really disrupt your gut microbiome. So as bad as sugar is, there could be a case maybe, maybe it is. I don't know. You know, yeah. why do people just eat food? I mean, have you ever, have you ever eaten a sweet potato? I'm guessing you have. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We eat them all the time. I mean, they're so good. Like, like, why would you put like, that's why I like, like, why would people be putting brown sugar and mar marshmallows on a sweet potato, especially the ones that are called Hannah yams or Hawaiian or Japanese. I mean, they are literally like eating candy to me. Yeah, I, I know. And I think that that is, again, it's this, we've got this idea for some reason in our culture that if it's a vegetable or a potato or, you know, a fruit, it's just not sweet enough. 
we have to add sweetness to it. I mean, this is the same thing for people who will add like a little bit of sugar on top of strawberries. I mean, it's really, I think, something that as a culture, we've just come to assume that we need to add sugar to everything. The yeah. food companies are doing that for us. And a lot of times people are doing it at home. And I, the coffee is the worst. I mean, if you go to any coffee shop these days, you know, especially some of those big chain ones that I, I won't name names, but I think we all know which ones I'm talking about. You know, you go in there and there's really hardly any coffee in the store. It's mostly just sugar. I mean, you know, with all the different versions of lattes and the different, you know, flavorings and sweeteners that are added, I mean, it's there's literally more sugar being served at those places than there is coffee. And so I think that's really just something that we have to step back and think, wow, you know what, like, this is happening and it's it's taking over and we need to, I think, kind of rein it in before it gets even worse than it is right now. Yeah. Okay. So here's some great questions from uh, live viewers. Okay, I saw them. They go fast. Uh, where did it go? It was about it was about which, which, what to say to children, which you're an expert at because number one, you wrote a book, What to Eat When You're Pregnant, and you actually have children. It's about what to say to them. Where did it go? Okay, come on, come on, come on. Where did that go? Ah, here from Deborah. What is the best way to describe to a child the reason for not eating or moderating sugar or other high fat foods without food shaming them? So how, how do we talk to our children, especially if they're exposed at a young age and, you know, like they are at school often with these birthday parties and things? Yeah, absolutely. So I can <laughs> from experience as a parent with this too, I have a 15 year old daughter and I have an eight year old daughter and they've both been raised by me and my husband. And obviously I have a certain opinion around added sugar and so the approach that we've taken is to teach them that this is not about looks. This is not about body weight. This is about being healthy and having energy so that you can have fun playing sports and have fun with your friends and you can focus at school. That's what this is about. And it's about showing them that these are the foods that, you know, were designed by nature, that are natural, that we cook with at home. And then these are processed foods that are man-made concoctions that, you know, somebody in some food laboratory somewhere put together to sell a product and teaching them the difference. You know, we tend to view these processed foods as in a very different category than food, than real food. And the processed foods are things that we need to severely limit our intake of because they're not healthy for us. And our body is our vehicle and we're driving this vehicle all day long and we got to put gas in it and we got to put the good gas in it. We're not going to, you know, if we had an electric car, we're not going to put diesel fuel in it because that's just going to mess it up and it's not going to work. So the same goes for our bodies. And so we want to fuel our bodies with the healthiest things that we can. I also think it's very important to take the approach with kids where you're teaching them to police themselves and to manage their own food intake. I, you know, if you, a lot of times parents will say, no, the kids aren't allowed to have this or not allowed to have that. And they have very strict rules around it. I think that in some cases with kids that can backfire because the minute you can't be hovering over them to remind them, no, 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 you can't eat that. Then they're going to run off with grandma or their friend's house. And they're going to, you know, have all the access that they can to these sweets. And they're not going to know how to limit themselves. So I think it's about teaching kids how to self-manage, how to make good choices, and about, again, approaching it from the stance of health. That's what this is about. This is about health. It's not about anything but that. Thank you. Jennifer says, I recently heard that date sugar isn't really sugar and it is healthier than date syrup. Is it true? So date, my understanding is that date sugar is dates that have been dehydrated and ground. So they're just another form of dates and date syrup are dates that have been reduced, at least when I make it. And my friend who has the company, I love date lady, you take dates and you boil it with a lot of water and you reduce it and then you blend it and you strain it. So this is the thing I like about you is you seem to be more um, 
how do I say this? Just more accepting of like carbohydrates and vegans. Cause a lot of the people in the food addiction, this is why I love you actually in the food addiction space are, are, are kind of almost anti-vegan. Like they're like, you gotta be keto. You know, if you have a sugar addiction, you can, you know, you can't eat fruit, which I think is ridiculous. Cause I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Cyrus Kambada or Dr. Robbie Barbero, who are New York times bestselling authors of mastering diabetes who are diabetic and eat almost a fruit exclusive diet. But, you know, so a lot of times I feel people need to know themselves and not eat anything that's going to be a trigger. But I, 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 you know, people are like, well, you know, if you're a sugar addict, you shouldn't be eating dates. Well, then maybe you shouldn't be eating monk fruit or stevia either. You know, if you want to get technical about that or, you know, they, they, they lump whole food carbohydrates like rice and potatoes in the same category as white sugar. Right. I mean, if you're a sugar addict, you shouldn't be having candy bars, right? Like that there's certain like classes of foods that we're trying to avoid. Those are the things we want to stay off, but stay away from, you know, the processed foods. But if you want to, you know, bake a cake and sweeten it with date syrup, and that's what's going to satisfy your sweet tooth, then go for it. I think that's the way to approach it. I think you're right, though, that there tends to be this sort of, you know, all or nothing approach to sweets and carbohydrates gets lumped in there. I really am an advocate for cutting back on the highly processed, man-made, food-like concoctions that we are inundated with in the grocery store these days, because those are the ones that have tons of added sugar. I mean, do you know how long you'd have to sit there eating apples to eat the amount of sugar that you would find in, you know, your typical, you know, processed food that has added sugar? I mean, it would... And time. how many apples can people really eat? I'm so tired of people bashing whole natural food that our ancestors ate throughout most of human history as bad or evil, you know? Yeah. And I think that it's somewhat of a distraction from the larger problem, right? Because I've, I've had this conversation with people in the past where, you know, they'll say, well, if you're addicted to sugar, then you, you can't eat any sugar. And that means you can't eat fruit. And, you know, that's not it at all. If you're addicted to sugar, Listen, let's put it this way. Our ancestors 100 years ago, nobody was addicted to sugar because we didn't have all the processed food. We're addicted to sugar because we've been overdosed by the food industry because it's in all the processed food. Absolutely. We're not addicted to sugar because of apples and bananas and strawberries and dates. It's because of the processed food. So that's where we got to start and get back to. Thank you so much. Now let's ask this question. Do you put flour, especially white flour or, re or highly refined flours in the same category? Because I didn't realize it. And again, everybody's different. You know, people exist on a continuum. And I always say to people, when in doubt, leave it out or experiment taking it out and see. But I read a book many years ago, and you probably are familiar with Dr. Joan Iflin called Sugars and Flowers, How They Make Us Crazy, Fat, and Sick. And I feel for people that struggle with sugar, you know, the white flour can be just as, as bad for them. It can. And, you know, you said it perfectly that people exist on a continuum, right? Where, you know, some people are so addicted to sugar that those flowers are going to be a trigger. And that's something that they need to then moderate their intake of. And I actually have another quiz in the book, Sugarless, about this, about how to figure out like what type of sugar addict you are, because that's the thing, you know, there's different degrees of this. There's not only different severities of sugar addiction, but there's different degrees and types of sugar addiction. So some people might be in that category where, yeah, they, it's not just the processed food that has added sugar, but it's the white bread, the pasta, the, you know, flowers, those things are still going to trigger them. And so they need to be mindful of those types of foods as well. But I think, you know, a lot of people find that even if they feel that, oh, I, I have a hard time controlling my intake of, let's say, pasta. If you start off with just focusing on reducing your added sugar, you might find that by doing that, you are able to then better regulate your intake of the pasta, right? Because by reducing the added sugar and that bolus of dopamine that's being released every time you have one of these food items that has all this added sugar, you're starting to heal your brain. You're starting to change it and make those differences that are going to impact your later food choices. And in many cases, that can mean that those cravings for those other carbohydrates aren't going to be as strong. Yeah. You know, I think that if this is, we, we started off talking about how some of the medical doctors that have even been on the show say it's not an addiction 
because you can't die from the withdrawal, but there still is a withdrawal. And I know that because I was the person that was drinking, you know, Coke Slurpees and Dr. Peppers till I was 43 years old. And when I went into what I call rehab, the Optimum Health Institute, there was actual physical detox. Yes, of course, I couldn't die from it the way you can with other drugs of abuse, but it was not pleasant. There were headaches, there was diarrhea, there was crying, there was anxiety. But I didn't have the tools that I have now. And I'm wondering what you recommend for that, because one of the things I've learned, and this is another reason I love about you, because so many people talk about, you know, you know, give kids fruit. You should, of course, but we're always going to love fruit unless we've been poisoned by sugar early on. We are going to love the taste of fruit. But you actually talk about the importance of vegetables, introducing them at a young age. And what I found kind of accidentally through running a program I used to run called the Ultimate Weight Loss Program is that dark green leafy vegetables, especially the cruciferous ones that are often the ones people don't like because they tend to be bitter, have this compound in them called thylakoids that I find are brilliant for getting people off of sugar because they, they Dr. Greger talks about it in his book, How Not to Diet, that they do something with uh, blocking fat absorption and blunting the, the turning off the hunger switch. So what do we, we do when we're having those cravings, you know, because we got off sugar and we got to have something sweet and, but, and we don't want to go to like, you know, the monk fruit and the stevia. What do you say to people? Yeah. So that's such a great question. Cause that's something that so many people struggle with. The withdrawal is real and it's not life threatening in the sense that, like you said, you're not going to die from it, but it's, it's real and it's discomforting and it for some people can be debilitating. It can cause irritability. It can cause you to be lethargic. It can cause you to feel weak. And it is something that you just have to get through. And it's going to be different for every person. Some people are like, Oh wow, you know, it wasn't that bad, but some people it's like two weeks of kind of not really feeling that great. And, you know, can't wait for this part of it to be over. So one of the things that I often tell people is, you know, focus on what I call in the book sugar list, the craving crushing foods. And so I have a list of these different foods that can really be helpful when you are trying to, you know, combat those cravings and just to, you know, focus on things that you can eat and have them on hand if you do feel a craving coming on so that if you, you know, have one that's really powerful that you feel like, oh, you know, I really have to give into this, then you'll have something that you can eat that, you know, isn't going to necessarily derail your plan. And so grapes, grapes are one that I talk about because grapes are extremely sweet. And most people who are hooked on sugar don't realize that because they probably haven't had a grape in a long time. But if you're coming off of sugar and you're looking for something that's sweet, you could focus on grapes. Um, another one is any kind of berry. Berries are really great because again, they're sweet, but they also have fiber. And the thing about the fiber is that it's going to make you feel fuller for longer. And I think that's one of the things that we, like you were saying about the cruciferous vegetables, anything that's going to interfere with your hunger signals is going to be wonderful for managing cravings because you want to promote satiety. You want to have foods that are going to make you feel fuller for longer. So you feel satisfied. That's where added sugar can be a demon because it doesn't produce any satiety. It produces psychological satiety momentarily because you eat it and you're like, oh, I feel great. And then guess what? A minute later, five minutes later, you want some more because you're not satisfied. You want to focus on foods that are going to keep you feeling fuller longer. Oats is another one. Oats is another example of a craving crushing food that can be great. And, you know, you don't have to just eat oatmeal like for breakfast. You can, you know, there's lots of different recipes for, I have one in here for oat squares, which you can use as like a breakfast treat, or you can use it as a, you know, dessert type treat. Um, oatmeal is something that, you know, my husband puts oatmeal in a smoothie in the morning. I mean, there's so many different versatile ways that you can use oats that can be great for helping to make you combat those cravings and making sure you're promoting your satiety. Absolutely. And I think, like, think, like you say, in all the foods you mentioned, fiber is the key. Fiber is what keeps us full and foods with fiber and water that haven't been stripped out of all their nutrients are really the answer. This chapter is really helpful. How to manage the three S's. I could say sugar, salt, and something else, but yeah. uh, stress, stress, setbacks, and social pressure. Man, that social pressure for people, especially I find many women and agreeable people, they, they succumb to things they don't want to succumb to because they, they can't withstand the pressure. Yeah. And you know what? I'm glad that you brought that up because I think that inherently, you know, humans, we are 
group animals, right? We, we want to be part of a group. That's natural. We're supposed to. That's the way that we evolved. And I think that it's hard for a lot of people to be the dissenter in the group, be that one person that's going to do the thing that's different than everybody else. And if you happen to have that type of personality where you don't like conflict and you like to kind of just go with the flow and you don't want to kind of ruffle feathers, then it might be difficult for you in a lot of these social settings. If you go to a party or if you're out to dinner with people or friends that, you know, you might feel like you're put on the spot about the choices that you're making in terms of what you're eating. And so that's something that I talk a lot about in the book and give people, you know, some different ways to think about how to respond when you're in these social settings so that it doesn't feel awkward. And, you know, I, I often find that people feel empowered when they can use it as an opportunity to tell people about something that they learned about research. So if you're reading my book, you know, you can say, oh, I'm reading this really great book, Sugarless. And the person who wrote it talks all about how sugar impacts the brain and our health. And, you know, there's these studies in rats and it can be a talking point where you can then educate somebody about, you know, why you're making these certain decisions to not eat certain things or to limit your intake of sugar. Um, if anything, you'll just bore them with the science, right? Because they'll say, oh, I don't want to talk to you anymore because <laughs> too much science. But again, I think it's just really about figuring out how you can navigate these social situations so that it doesn't have to be awkward or uncomfortable. But I will say, you know, it is going to mean you're going to have to maybe stand up and be that person who's going to say, you know what, not me. And I will tell you this, there's somebody I guarantee in the room who isn't at the point where you are with their courage, who can't stand up yet. And if you stand up and say, no, I'm good. I don't want dessert or no, I'm not having that because I'm not eating it. That's going to encourage and embolden that person to maybe be able to say no as well and stand up. So if you're not doing it for yourself, look at it like you're doing it for that other person who really may need extra help and encouragement and they can get that from you. And there's, yeah, that's a, that I never heard that before. That's great. I almost feel like we need sugar empowerment um, refusal classes for women, because for me, like abstinence makes me feel proud. Like I don't feel embarrassed that I don't drink alcohol or, or take, I mean, like, I feel proud. Like, I'm like, yeah, me, you know, like, I'm not saying you're bad, but I'm like, yay me, you know, that I'm not in the throes of this addiction that I was in for 43 years. So it's, it's, it's tough though, especially look what's coming up. We got two more holidays to get through at least. Yeah. And, you know, I think one of the things about social situations that I think is so critical is to have a plan. You know, when you get invited to parties or you're going to different events, bring something that you're going to want to eat or drink as what you're bringing as your offering. I think that's critical because if you go into these situations without something that, you know, you feel comfortable eating or that, you know, is part of what you're looking to eat, you might end up in a room full of sugar that you don't want to be in. And then what are you going to do? So I always think it's a good idea to come prepared and to, you know, make sure that you have a plan. Don't go into these situations, especially around the holidays, you know, without your two or three lines that you can give to somebody if they start pressuring you to have, you know, some sugary drink that you don't want or, you know, a dessert that you're just not interested in having. Yeah. You know, I think about, you know, just when I was little, I remember what was it? I forget what was it, Mary Poppins or, you know, just a spoonful of sugar, you know, yeah, the medicine. I mean, it really is insidious in our culture, in our songs, you know, it's it's everywhere. So but thank you so much for the work you do. And guys, we're talking today with Dr. Nicole Avina. If you haven't seen her TED talk, it's got it's almost 17 million views now. It's five minutes that will change your life. And link is below. Please get the book this week or today if you can, because it really will help her out. It's a wonderful book on how to not only understand that sugar really is addictive, but a plan to get off it so you can be sugar less, or in my case, sugar none, whatever your choice is. Thanks so much. I wish you every success with the book. Don't be a stranger. Come on anytime because I really, uh, I admire you and I love your work and I, I hope the book does really well. Oh, thank you so much, Chef AJ. It's always such a pleasure to talk with you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Avina. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific, no, excuse me, 9 a.m. Pacific time for Dr. Stefan Esser. Let's see what he's talking about. Oh, we're going to talk about your pancreas, plants in your pancreas. And I'm guessing sugar is not very good for our pancreas, is it, Dr. Avina? No, it is not. You'll hear about that. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everyone. Take care.